Good afternoon and welcome to 2023 and most importantly, welcome back to the club. Absolutely fantastic year ahead. Special one as our 10th anniversary and as always, I'm joined by the, the trusty James Dawes. Welcome to 2023, sir. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you, George. Like you said, 10th anniversary, um, really special landmark in the club's uh, history since we started, obviously, back in yourself in 2013. Uh, I'm sure we'll have time to reflect on on that ten years as a whole, maybe later on in the in the sort of the series with a special episode or or such. But today's all about this season so far. You know, we've been so fortunate to see so many fantastic things throughout the club over the course of the first five months, and so much more to look forward to over the the, the next five months as well. Definitely, I mean, it's hard these shows to really fit in all the information that we have and, and highlight all the special things that are going on day to day. But you know, really. This is my favourite part of the season. We're back, you know, we've sort of built the foundations in the first half and now we're in the, the thick of it. You know, obviously first year as a, as a professional football club with our senior team and that's been um, certainly more trials, you know, than it has been a delight so far. And um, I think it'll be interesting to see if we are capable to turn that around and remain in professional category. It doesn't look great right now, but of course, you know, we're working hard every day and we're most of all sticking to our values, which is believing in young players. Exactly. And, and that's ever more, never more evident than, you know, the sort of the trials that we've seen, you know, at the back end of 2022. Uh, you know, we've got John Correa on the show today. He was fortunate enough to go to, to Mallorca, a legal level club and have a really positive experience there. Really looking forward to seeing what he has to say on the experience as a whole and the advice he shares for, for the future players. But also 2023, starting off on, on the right foot, right? We've already had, uh, you know, showcase games for our Feminino against a, a professional side from the Netherlands in the P, in PSV. And also a, a huge, huge game against uh, a national team of, of Germany uh, at youth level. So certainly uh, bodes well for the, for the future. I think, you know, it shows to be recognised by, you know, not only now just the top clubs in Europe, which, you know, have been fortunate and humbled by. There's been a few years now to be travelling around and playing some of the, you know, the who's who of, uh, of world club football to now be on the, the radar of, uh, of a national federation and, and one such as you know Germany, they're spending time here in, in southern Spain and to be earmarked and picked out as valuable opposition for them, you know, for me is uh, maybe the, the biggest accolade we've had so far. And like you say, it's all centred around providing opportunity for the players. So, you know, with Eli on today, uh, Tariq, who also got, you know, an international call up, which we're really f looking forward to getting into uh, later on in the show and, and John. Uh, but then we move past that into sort of uh, the next phase of the show with with Ryan Edwards, who's you know been a close friend of the club for for a number of years now. He's obviously over here in Spain doing some training with yourself, um, and we've also got the exciting news, you know, announcing uh, Nicky Travis as the the head coach of the U23s. Obviously, a former Premier League coach just three years ago, I think. So uh, you know, not bad going. And I think you know it shows that 2023 is about evolution, is about keep moving forwards, is about advancing as a, a group of staff and, and really to be able to provide the, the best of the best, not only in the showcases and the games, but also what you're getting day to day on the on the turf, you know, and bringing people in that are coming for environments that can can add to what we're doing, um, you know. And, and again, we talk about the environment so much, and what does that mean, you know, to have a, a Ryan Edwards, you know, who's here knocking about on the pitch of us. I mean, yesterday we were doing some personal work, and uh, and he joined in with our U17 group for the rondos, you know. It. I don't know if the boys always quite understand the types of people that are here using what is FC Malaga City to help their career, you know, and, and they're fully established professionals that have played you know, hundreds of games in the Football League and in Korea and in the Scottish Premiership. Yeah, and for me, you know, everybody, you know, watching this show, obviously my, myself and George as the presenters, but even more so with fans of, of the players and the guests that we have on the show. So to get a chance to, to, to speak with all of them today, really hear their stories, um, for, for Nick and, and Ryan here, their sort of advice that they'd share to, to the boys in the academy, you know, really looking forward to it. And so I don't think we should waste any more time than getting straight into the thick of it. The Premier League is the best league in the world and to visit a club such like this is such a grateful and amazing opportunity. Incredible, already excited for the second trip to Tottenham already, but even more excited to be joined by our first guest of 2023. Let's see how nervous they are. Roll it away, James. <laughs> yeah, we always like to put them under the cosh, um, sort of early parts of the show, but I'm, I've got a feeling today the boys are going to be just fine. So, uh, you know, John, um, you know, starting off with you today, you're the you're fortunate one that gets to kick us off. Uh, obviously, such a, you know important first five months for yourself. 
uh, for many different reasons. But tell us first everything that we need to know about you as a, as a person, as a player. Um, I'm 17 years old. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm Puerto Rican and Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So I got the Euro nice European in me, yeah. Uh -huh. um, football is my life, to be honest. I live for so, yeah. Fantastic. Um, obviously, we, we wouldn't be doing you justice if we didn't sort of kick things off. Um, obviously, been an important part of the, the academy system, spells at the, the 18s and 19s um, throughout. Uh, obviously, such a landmark uh, moment this season so far was, was your trial at Mallorca, George, something that you know we look to really promote is these players' experiences and trials at the, the big professional clubs. Um, you might want to touch a little bit on how that came about and so no, on. I mean, I think the, the first objective of Malaga City is obviously to get players outside of our network, get them progressing, get them progressing to, to the biggest professional clubs that, that we can. Obviously, we have our own internal now pathway through to a, our own Tessera club. But first and foremost, you know, especially for the, for the younger players, if they can get picked up from La Liga academies, that has to be the, the priority. And having someone, you know, like Biri is one of our main head coaches here, uh, ex-professional player as well, fortunate to say teammate at Jerez, but spent a lot of time at, at Mallorca, has good contacts there, obviously we've gone there the last two years to play exhibition games and um, you've got yourself put forward and from outstanding performances in the, the first half of the season, meeting the requirements of, of what they're looking and tell us what was that like to go into to such a prestigious club and for me quite a special club, you know, because there's not they've got any neighbours, they're on an island, they're sort of on their own, you know, so it's a very big part of the community there. Yeah, um, no, it's a beautiful place to be. Um, and I'm very blessed to be given the opportunity to trial with them, and it was an amazing experience. The five days being there with the with the guys, and obviously me and me and Jacob Marshall, um, it was an amazing experience. The top level players, professional, it was it was amazing. And how how's your level of Spanish at the moment? Um, I, to be fair, I say it's pretty good because yeah. I'm grateful to have my mother, Puerto yeah. Rican mother, so we get yeah. some Spanish in there. Um, but yeah, I think. I think it's very good to, mm -hmm. and so to learn the Spanish as well. You get to go, obviously, internally with a club like that, where all the sessions are in, in Spanish, etc. But there, they also have a different dialect as well. Did you notice that much, or were they speaking I mean, mostly Castellano? Yeah, mostly Castellano. But I'm not really used to that, so, yeah. but I think I'm, I'm picking it up little by little, so it's getting, it's getting better. And I think one of the things we always try and get across to players is that we're kind of a stopgap. Like, this is the level that everybody tries to reach, um, you know, is to try and get yourself in one of the top professional clubs in Spain. And so you come here, you're exposed to Spanish cultures, Spanish terminology, you're obviously living in a town, you know, culturally you're getting that type of experience. But then there is that next progression where you go into an environment where, you know, you're not, you know Spanish is not your first language, uh, you know, you don't know anybody, you've got to kind of uh, simulate yourself into the environment as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, we're always massive advocates of trying to learn the language. Obviously, the Spanish classes for international players are, you know, a mandatory bit of the, you know, the programme here in, in Spain in order to get the visa. Um, but I also think it's really, really important because, again, explain what it's like to go into an environment where you don't know anybody. You've got five days to kind of give a, you know, a fair representation of yourself. Uh, were there any other challenges, though, you know, that you found going into that other than the level, obviously? Or um, honestly, not really. I mean, I say for for being somewhere where you're not where you're not really comfortable in. Mm -hmm. I think I say I'm pretty used to that because. And in, in, um, in America, I'd go to different clubs. I've been to different clubs, sure. meeting new people. So it's honestly just how you how you start it, and it'll soon pick on, and it'll get up. You, yeah. You'll feel more comfortable. In terms of like training setup and uh, maybe training level, you know, talking a little bit off camera and things. How would you describe differences from when you're here at Malaga City to when you go into into an environment like that? Yeah, um, and like I said, these the players I trialed with were top level professionals. Sure. Do this for a living, so. I mean, it was the intensity is a lot higher than mm -hmm. here in Malaga City, but I think for for me in my head I was always like, you know, you gotta kind of push through it and and you know pick on their their speed and sure. it'll soon come to you and yeah. And so you've had sort of your first dip in the you know, toe in the water there and and seeing what it's about, seeing what the top you know flight professional youth players are like. You've taken away lots of learnings. Do you now look in the mirror and say, yeah, with a little bit more work, I can get to that? Or, or is that something that you thought, wow, that's a, a different world? I'm not sure I'm going to be capable of that. I mean, in my head, I always want to, I always want to keep, keep pushing forward, keep always, always to, um, to push myself to a higher level, no matter what. Because um, for me, I'll never be comfortable with, with where I am. So. Yeah. It's always good to be uncomfortable in situations like that. Yeah, and I want to ask, because obviously you come from a, you know, a very good background. You play a good level club, club soccer in the US and whatnot. 
Um, a lot of people, when I'm speaking to them about the potential of them coming here to the academy, they want to know the differences between the sort of that level, the top level youth uh, in in the US, and obviously the level here in Spain at the top pro, sort of pro academy clubs. What do you see as the biggest differences? Um, I say the biggest difference is probably passion for me. Like some of these players, like from a very young age, like newborn, they would yeah. they live for this sport. You know, that's that's kind of like the heritage and yeah. culture in this in this country. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a big part, and that's what I live for. Because obviously, coming from Portuguese heritage, football is all—it's what yeah. it's all about. So, I'm glad yeah. I got to pick that on. So it's like a sensational experience when you, know, you turn up in New York. Obviously, you got kind of a bit lucky. We got to be there with the academy lads for a few days first, played an exhibition game, but then you then everyone goes home. You know, mum and dad are gone type of thing, and you're, you're left there sort of behind enemy lines. And uh, you're pulling on that New Yorker training kit. And you look down and you see a badge, and there was so much history. What what would that feel like? What was that sensation like? It's it's honestly a very like it's it's a very good it's a very good feeling to feel like yeah. you know you're you're playing for you're trialing for a La Liga academy. It's mm -hmm. I don't think for me it'd be any other greater feeling than that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Last last one for you. Would you have done anything differently having had that experience now? Like you said, you first sort of dip in the water. Uh, if you had that, that experience again, would you have done anything different? Um, honestly, to do anything different, I would kind of just take my experience and then afterwards just build on from it, you mm -hmm. know, like, because the experience is done. Now it's just up to me. I know what I have to do to improve and I just carry on and pick it on from there to... Amazing. Right and I think the most important thing, the feedback was very good for, from the from the clubs that you went to. Obviously, we've not even mentioned Granada, that you went to another huge club in Spain that you, that you had a, a trial experience with. Um, and obviously, they're, they're mentioning they're going to monitor you throughout the season. So, first of all, huge congratulations. Thank we you. we know and we hope that this is not the uh, the kind of the, the the last experience that you're going to face in this terms of uh, you know opportunity. But uh, you know, Tariq, moving on to yourself. Um, you're someone that came in a little bit of a younger age, you're in 06, um, again coming from the US uh, background, but tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, and a little bit about you know your experience so far this season. Uh, I came from Monterey, California, and uh, I played with the San Jose Earthquakes, which was like an MLS team, and then I played with like a, a Breakers, which was another MLS team, but it wasn't as good. So I decided that I wanted to try it out, come overseas, pursue the dream. Is that in the MLS Next Division you're playing? Yeah. Now? Yeah. 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 And obviously for you, um, again, another amazing opportunity, a little bit different to, to John's that we mentioned. Um, you obviously got the call up from, from Algeria, which you have obviously yeah. descendancy from. Tell us a little bit about that and your link to Algeria. So my father was born in Algeria and he moved to the US when he was about 20. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. He just, he like always had wanted to get us an Algerian passport. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've always had one. And I've always, <laughs> I've visited like, um, I've visited, I would go on vacation. And um, I've always wanted to play for Algeria over like the US. Like, I just. You felt more connection with Algeria. Yeah, I felt okay, more I connection. Always and I've, I've always tried to push Algeria and not really go into the US. Uh -huh. And was this a connection that you'd had previously? You know, was it something that was on your radar when you were at the likes of, you know, San Jose and um, and so on, or did that just kind of start when you arrived here in Europe? So, it kind of just started when I was in, like, came when I was in Europe, because when I was in the U.S., like, I had wanted to obviously, but there's just nothing to like go off of. There's mm -hmm. no connections. And and how did that kind of start? Then talk us through that link because I I, I still remember to this day receiving the email. Uh, you know, obviously requesting you to go for, for the mm -hmm. international camp, and we'll talk a little bit in depth about that experience. But wh were you aware of the interest beforehand, or was it kind of just news to you when it when it came about? So there's like a, a Algerian interviewer. So like he runs a, a news, like he kind of just picks up, like he finds news Algerian pieces. players, mm -hmm. and he kind of like he is personal, like friends with the coach. Mm -hmm. okay. So. He yeah. kind of brought my name up, and the coach started watching a few games. And, and I think we're looking at the screen here at the, at the back here. Uh, yeah. This is probably the, one of the reasons that you were on the radar, you know. Yes. Uh, you know, you've, been, you've made a name for yourself as a bit of a free kick specialist, mirroring that kind of knuckleball that, that you see from the likes of Ronaldo. Uh, yeah. This was actually against Granada, right? Talk us through this free kick. So, when it, like, I don't know, I think it was um, Alex who drew the drew the foul, and 
I kind of just went to the ball right away. Like, I knew I wanted to take it. And, like, when I set the ball up, it's just, like, so I'm so focused. Like, you don't hear anything around you, and you're just so focused on where you want to hit the ball, where it wants to go, and you kind of just you go for it. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, so you're coming from, you know, one of the... You've been in one of the most prestigious clubs, those MLS clubs. There's not, there's not loads in the, in the States, and it's a very... Mm -hmm select few that are in their, their academy system. So you've had a, you know, a great basis coming from something like that. And then now you're here, obviously, in our program um, and our training methodology. How many times a week would you train back home? And is it different to here? And, and what would you So say? back home, I would have to, I would train three, time, three or four times a week. Right. But I would have to commute about an hour okay. each way. Yeah. Okay. I think this is the thing that not a lot of people, you know, the sacrifice that parents and families make in the US and not just the US, Australia, you know, some of the bigger countries is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think that continuity in terms of, you know, here, obviously a residency program, you wake up, you eat, sleep and breathe football. Yeah. Um, and, you know, do you feel like you've improved uh, during your time? I think so. I think the more training, a little bit more intense, like it definitely, like you can this tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get a little better technically and everything. Question I got on the other side. So I see a lot of players, obviously you guys, you know, normally club soccer back in the States or other countries like you know, three, four times a week, three times a week is like general, you know. Um, and then you know, I want more football, I want more football. Um, and you get into an environment like Malaga City and it's every day you're expected, you're scrutinised, a bit more competition for places. Maybe you're not the star, only star on the team. There's four or five real top players pushing you, um, maybe someone in the same position. Is it ever too much football? Do you ever wake up and think, oh, I've got to train again? I don't think so. No. I think if I you're think, gonna yeah. if you're gonna make the move to come overseas, like you have to expect it. Yeah. Like and I said, if you don't if you don't live it, then yeah. you know, it's gonna be difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be difficult for you. Well, I've seen that over like you know talking deck and I've worked with young players, you know, similar to yourselves that they have have a dream, and sometimes a dream can turn to nightmare quite quickly, you know. And it's like, <laughs> oh, I really like football, but when it was three times a week in the game on the weekend and we won 5-0 and you know, now you can get saturated, sure. you know? And, you know, I, I think we're always very honest, uh, you know, with players. Um, I think this experience, if anything, it tells you how much you, you really think, you know, or you really want it versus how much you really think you want it, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, when you get into the sort of the latter parts of, you know, the first part of the season and certainly, you know, sort of as we move into months eight and nine in, the, in this season, you know, fatigue's kicking in, you're missing home, and you boys are away from home for the first time, which is a huge thing. It's very taxing, you know, mentally and physically. Mm -hmm. So what you'll often find in that is it reveals whether people are in love with the idea of being a professional yeah. footballer a lot more than what it takes. And your experiences in the international camp, uh, Tariq, and obviously John with, uh, with Mallorca, I think you get a glimpse of the players that are kind of touching that level and around like-minded individuals where you realise, listen, mm -hmm. I need to be serious with this. Um, so finishing up, Tariq, with you, just just give an idea of your your hopes for the for the kind of future for the remainder of the season and uh, and you know we pass that. Um, well, hopefully, I, like I want to have a good season, but um, <laughs> uh, Algeria is open. Like they're hosting the African Cup for the U17, wow. so I'm hoping that I get called up for that, and that'll be in April. April, wow, wow. Yeah. Big something, news. Yeah, something to look forward to. So, yeah. um, you know, we'll certainly wish you the best of luck for that. And, uh, yeah, hopefully see some of those uh, those free kicks on the international stage. Huh? Oh, yeah. But, um, George, the next guest, uh, obviously Eli. Uh, some may say the best for last, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, but, no, no, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, Eli, obviously it's great to have you on um, as well. You've got a very different story to the likes of John and, and Tariq. You know, you've done a lot of moving throughout your, your sort of life, never mind your career. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm Eli. I'm from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, lived in four different countries, mainly due to my mum's work. She's a teacher, so we moved around a lot. And honestly, you know, football's my life, just like John said. So every country I moved into, the first thing that was on my mind was just like, what team are we going to play for? And then, yeah. Yeah. Which countries have you lived in? I lived in so New Zealand to start, then I moved to Brunei, and then China, wow. Shanghai, and now here in Europe and Spain. Tell us about your experience in each of those countries and how they differed a little bit. Maybe the football culture, uh, the challenges you faced. Obviously, uh, when you moved to China, it was in the height of COVID, right, yeah. as well, which, uh, which didn't help. But uh, tell us a little bit about that. So New Zealand was basically just youth football. So it was just like me having a kick around on a, on a Saturday and then training once a week or maybe twice a week. But then, um, you know, when I moved over when I was 13 to Brunei, that's when I first got a glimpse of the, the pro game, I'd say. So I got asked to go and trial out for a professional team then me and my brother ended up both getting in and um, you know 
that was just the first taste of professional football and ever since I had that, you know, I've always wanted to, um, you know, keep going and progress. And then I moved to Shanghai, which was, like you said, in COVID time. So it was quite difficult to, you know, get my feet on the ground and get going. But there I would say just in China, it's a bit more robotic. It's almost like here, you know, people bleed football mm. in, in Spain, you know. You know, every single person, you see it on the TV when you walk past restaurants, everything. So here it's just more passion, it's more technical. You know, everyone just, yeah, like I said, bleed football. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you, you know, you're having a, a pretty good season yourself. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that it's really interesting, Eli, obviously being a, a twin as well. So Brother yeah. Finn's also uh, doing very well as part of the academy. Maybe we'll get him on a future one and <laughs> compare the two yeah. to see who uh, does, you know, who does better. But, uh, you know, for, for, for us, Eli, you know, we see the clips and everything like that. And one of the things that we've been working on this week, you know, I've got to, to sit down with you on a personal level and, and sort of put your materials together from the first part of the season. Mm. Tell us what you think the, the biggest lesson's been since you arrived at the, the academy. You know, we, we obviously see the clips behind you. I think you're more of a technical style midfielder. Would you say that's more suited to the, to the way we play here in Spain? Oh, definitely. I mean, honestly, here it's even more technical than you could ever imagine. Like, I thought it was technical in Brunei and... Um, in uh, Shanghai as well, but you come here, it's just different, two touch, keep the ball as long as you can, you know, that's been pretty difficult to adapt to, but, you know, I think that I'm doing well so far, and, you know, hopefully I can just keep, you know, playing simple, just like doing what the coaches tell me, and, you know, play for the badge, play for the team. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, in our academy, we have, um, you know, we're here as the development program, as individual goals, but at the same time, you've seen there is a first team to move through. You know, how much do you feel that being in, say, the U19s, and obviously yourself, you came and trained with us you know, it was once mm, or twice. Yeah. Um, talk, talk us about and what is it like to be in the academy also as a first team as well? I mean, the first team is just like, that's the, the last step that I want to get to. It's, you know, in the 19s, it's great, but you see that, that professional glimpse, you know, you watch them on a Sunday, and, you know, it's really good level. You want, you want to play there. You want to be amongst the, the best players in the in the academy and the team and just, you know, that just step into the professional game, you know, like I said, I trained with them a few times um, and you, you just go there, you're in and amongst the players that you watch sometimes and you're just like, yeah, you really, you want that taste and you, once you get the taste, you just want it more and more. Mm -hmm. And so sort of which player out of, say, Malaga City scene team do you base yourself on or do you, do you look up to and think, you know, uh, I can learn from him or I can take his shirt even? Um, don't know if I could take his shirt, but Pape, yeah. he's an incredible player, you know. I was sitting once with Barry, which is the U18 coach, and he just kept telling me about how I need to play more like him and just simple, two touch. He's just an incredible player at the at the club. Yeah. So you're player, you know, you've identified him, and then you know you then train with him, you know, all of a sudden. And, and what kind of personal takeaways did you have from the the sessions? When he was, um, when I trained with him, he wasn't actually there, but I was looking at Sergi a lot. He yeah. was he was helping me out quite a lot. You know, just telling me where to move because obviously, you know, he has so much experience in that and mm. just football in the professional game and. You know, just like being able to play alongside him, just learn from him is just honestly like a real humbling experience for me. Mm. Fantastic. And I think one of the things we touched upon, Eli, like when we were talking about that experience in the first team is you didn't feel like you were a million miles away from the level and such. Uh, but George, you might even even be able to give some advice on this. For a young player, what does it take to come into that senior team environment? Because even the likes of John that's been mm. on trial, I'm sure, with Tariq as well, they go to these levels and they're not a million miles away, if not you know, equal to some of the yeah. level players there. But sometimes people say it's a bit of luck, sometimes mm. it's time. And what does it kind of take for a young player to break into the, to the first team? I think John was talking, like, she came and trained us a couple of days as well. And I think um, it's, it's finding some, good, some key habits that you can repeat very, very easily that you're comfortable with so that you can maybe the first couple of days produce those habits that you're going because the tempo is going to go up, the intensity is going to go up. And if you're trying to mould straight in and play how they want you to play, you know, you said yourself, you know, technically I feel I need to get a little bit better and things like that. So maybe, you know, you get a few key habits. I'm going to play, maybe if I'm a midfield player, I'll play more to the right. So I've got a little bit out in the wings, a little bit more time in my first couple of days while you bed in and get used to the tempo. Um, and I think it's about sometimes people come in, say, on a trial and you want to do everything to try and impress and get the attention. But it's about doing the simple things well um, and almost being at the level once you show that you can you know, sort of hang at that level, so to say, you know, then you get more, you buy yourself more time, tend to start showing a little bit more about, you know, what your personal qualities are, you know, and I felt, you know, Gabrielle came with you, I think, for mm -hmm. a couple of sessions, and the main thing that we took away as a coaching team was, you know, you guys turned the ball over a little more than maybe some mm -hmm. of the, the senior players, and just valuing, you know, if you were playing a Tessera game, that means you're running maybe, for, you're playing against Marbella, they're not going to give it straight back to you, you know, yeah, yeah. so um have to really value possession and how much you have to look after it, and can't give it away, sort of, you know, with... Uh, individual individual areas or decision making you know and I think uh, decision making is one of the hardest things now and yeah you know, how do you coach that how do you improve that you know it's a word that gets thrown around a lot and a lot of it comes down to you know your reading of the game and uh, 
and being prepared what you're going to do before you get the ball. I think naturally you've got a built-in thermostat as well, right? So like whatever level you're around, whatever players you're around, you kind of normally assimilate to that, that kind of level, right? So the more experiences that you boys can you know, get at that kind of level... Uh, you know, is is only going to help you and increase your game. And then when you go into an environment where it's not foreign to be around better players and the game's a bit faster and so on, that's when we'll see the best of you. But it's certainly exciting for the future. I mean, um, you know, you boys have done, you know, been some of the standout players this year. And for me, we look at the last part of the season, the last five months, and this is really the business end. You know, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Um, so for me, on a personal level, you know, knowing you guys on a on a you know a personal level, like I mentioned, you know, really excited to see that where that takes you. The last two things from me that I just want to kind of wrap up with, you know, we've had a good you know kind of laugh um, you know throughout the course of the day doing this. I want to touch upon your relationship as 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 friends uh, in the team environment because as much as you are here, you are dedicated. You are here for your own individual reasons. You've also I, I would like to think having a good time while you're doing it. So just talk a little bit about the feeling around the camp and in the academy if you can. Yeah, I mean, having all the boys with you, you know, all working for the same goal, I mean, there's not much better than that, you know, there's a ton more, a ton more boys back at the hotel, uh, you know, training today, you know, they're just great guys and just having them all there with, you know, training, working hard, it's just the environment here that we create is real, it's real special. It's yeah, awesome. and mm-hmm. sorry, and also like, yeah, you're here for an individual goal, like you want to be at the top level, but you also need to surround yourself by... By good teammates as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's I'm right. lucky to have that as well. That's amazing. I think yeah. challenge for me is you know you look in the, you said you're coming to watch the games on Sundays. Hopefully you know you're not missing the bus and missing the game. You've seen people like Cameron Williams now back fit. Angels our club captain. You know, he's been sat exactly yeah. where you guys are. Neil's played six games this season. You know, Nicky Guyo, another player to come through the academy. We've got kind of a middle generation. And you like so you and Santos. You know, Calvin Ransbury, mm. Colby obviously comes young. But can, my challenge to you guys would be you know you've. You started well, but it's only a few months, you know, yeah. to be a, a good player and to go to where you guys are talking about going, it's got to be consistent over, you know, such a, a long period of time. Can you be the next Cameron Williams and Angel within our club structure? And that's mm-hmm. going to no doubt give you the chance and platform to, to move on like Mike mm-hmm. Mapisa and Backer, yeah. etc. Last one, boys. Any bit of advice for anybody watching at home that aspires to kind of replicate your success that you've seen in the early days and also thinking of maybe taking up this opportunity? You know, you've all been on that side of the camera. Um, tell us a little bit about what you'd say to yourself now looking back uh, after the first five months. I mean, for me personally, I will just say, you know, the work doesn't start when you get here, it starts before. You need to keep putting the work in before you come here because you're not coming here just, you know, straight away just getting fit and stuff like that. You have to come, be fit, be prepared because the coaches are here, they want to push you, they want to get the best out of you and not just you as an individual player but the, the team as a whole, you've got to realise you're playing for a club, you're not mm. here just to make... Well, you are here to make yourself better, but it's not all about yourself, you know. Mm. You're playing for a badge. Um, that's awesome. And, yeah, that's just probably the main thing that I would say, just work hard before you get here. Fantastic. Yeah. Really good answer, no? Yeah, I like that one, yeah. Anyone got anything better? Or? I don't think I could top it, but... <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, I said, like, yeah. if, you have a, if you have a goal, you have to just do whatever you can to reach it. Yeah, and yeah you just got to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's I love that's it. amazing. Yeah, well, boys... Firstly, thank you so much for being on. Uh, we look forward to seeing how the second part of the season uh, you know, pans out for you, but something tells me you boys are going to be all right. So uh, thank you so much. Thank Good you. luck in the game this afternoon. Yeah, yeah George, cheers. next up, we've got obviously a little bit of a different look with uh, Ryan Edwards, who we mentioned earlier on, and uh, obviously Nicky Travis as well, that have you know been at the level that these boys aspire to and come yeah. with a load of experience. So boys, hope you're listening, because I'm sure it's going to be full of uh, some good content. Yeah, all right. Yeah, cheers. Hella shameless, necklace on me decorated. All this got me feeling jaded. Hold up, hold up, I'll be waiting. Bad thing on my radar. Told me that I'm in a playlist. Flower bomb, she a lotus. Got me thinking that I'm famous. I remember when I prayed for this. No sleep, cause I'm anxious. All this shit for entertainment. Crazy thinking that it's day one. All this been it for the taking. Yeah, hold it down for the nameless. Cannot wait for this part of the show, most of all for the haircuts. Delighted <laughs> that we're going to be joined by 
good friend and top pro, Ryan Edwards. Um, thanks so, so much for your time and, and coming in. And um, I know you've been had a lot on since the new year and certainly been been training a lot and putting you through your paces, hopefully. But um, welcome to the club. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, thanks for having me on, to be honest. You've been incredible. The club's been incredible having me in for uh, my second time here. I was here 18 months ago and I'm, I'm here again. And I'm, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. How, how's it been? Obviously, you know, we'll start sort of and go backwards. You know, you were here training with us and um, the weather was a bit nicer then, by the way. It was in the in the summer break and um, you just come out of a uh, contract at, at Burton. Um, sort of getting prepared for the unknown and then, you know, a fantastic opportunity to go to Asia and uh, and with Korea. How, how was that? How has it been? Yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, it's nice finishing an off season in England um, after a grueling 46, 47 game season and coming into you know, the summer in, in this part of the world to train with you one-on-one -on -one and, yeah. and um, your staff here at the backroom staff, the strength and conditioning coaches. And then, um, yeah, to receive news that you receive an offer to go play football in Korea, which is an awesome opportunity and incredible experience. Um, football was, was fantastic and such a cool experience to go just experience another language, another culture, try yeah. different foods. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at that here, like we've got, we pulled the stats up, so forgive me if they're wrong because they're off transfer market, but <laughs> 99 appearances in the Scottish Premiership, 75 appearances in, um, in League One, you know, 50 appearances now obviously in the K-League Two. For the, for the younger boys to be around a pro like yourself that has such that experience, I think it's fantastic, but I also want to touch upon, like you said, you've been training in the off-season, how important that is. Having done that over so many years now and played at such a high level for so many years, how important is that consistency in terms of never letting your kind of standard slack, always working hard in the off-season to maintain that level? Like, How difficult is it to be at that level for a prolonged period of time? Oh, it's, it's very difficult and it's not just your physical that you need to look after. So first, when the season finishes, it's the mental break. I do like taking two, three weeks off. You know, I, I do enjoy traveling and having a beer or having a wine, having some nice food. Um, but then after that little refresher, my, my mind quickly switches back. That I got pre-season coming up soon, so I'll start my own pre-pre-season and that starts the, the physical preparation. And um, yeah, it's been nice. Sometimes it's been by myself um, in a park or on the beach or, or whatnot. But yeah, to come into this type of facility where it's a you know, professional environment um, and have all the everything available, nutrition, chefs, um, sports and conditioning, um, yeah, the beach for recovery, and, <laughs> of course, and, 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 and the many football pitches and coaches on, on available. It's been, it's been great to use that. Fantastic. And what's your, what's your biggest motivator behind that? Like, what keeps you going year upon year to really push your body and your mind as far as you possibly can go? I mean, you're a very ambitious person, knowing you're on a personal level. You know, you're still very much in the peak of your kind of career and very motivated to go, you know, even further than you've been previously. But what is your biggest motivator behind, you know, your, your work ethic and your work rate? But first is enjoyment. I, I, I love the game and I still love the game. And um, I'm 29 now and I've had a lot of difficult moments and experiences. And when you get to that phase waking up or you're home alone with your, with your family and it's like, oh, can you keep going? There's something in me that wants to keep going no matter what. And I, I take a lot of uh, experience from uh, w watching not just football pros like Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Ronaldo, Messi, but you know, Tom Brady in the NFL, yeah. mm -hmm. um, playing at 45 years old, you think, and they're looking after their body, they're doing everything right. Um, I'd love to, to get to, not 45, but <laughs> <laughs> to, to, a good, to a good 35, 36, 37, and, and I'm still 29, so that's hopefully a, a good seven, eight years of being a professional footballer. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you come in, you know, Australian background, um, obviously been around the um, international scene there as well, which must be a, a, an incredible honour, and... Um, and then you, know, you come over to Europe. What was that transition like to be, you know, growing up in Australia and then to come and try and you know, break it in Europe, so to speak, you know? Yeah. For, for Australian footballers in, in my age group growing up, the pinnacle was coming to the UK or, or Europe. Yeah. Um, the, the league back then wasn't as good and there's limited teams and, yeah. you know, there weren't many finances and opportunities for young players. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to the Australian Institute of Sport, um, which is very similar set up to... This program here is a residence yeah. program. You, you you eat, breathe, play football nonstop. Mm -hmm. You got you do your schooling there. So I had a year there, um, which prepared me for a European adventure because I was in a full time environment, mm -hmm. five times a week training with a game and a day off. So um, I got really used to that from from the outset. But then it takes it up another level. I signed at seventeen at Reading, yeah. and it took maybe three four months to to get into the swing of things physically and mentally. Being away from home, you kind of. A bus hits you, it takes the wind out of you, yeah. thinking, how, how can I do this? 
Um, but then you kind of get over that little barrier. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I just wanted to keep on this train and keep going. Yeah. As, a, as a graduate, you know, going a bit off of uh, off script here, as a graduate of AIS, what do you feel about that program being shut down? Oh, gutted. Gutted, gutted yeah. to be honest. I think a lot of players spoke out about it shutting down. I think it's... Um, I, I get what, what they're doing with all the academy youth, youth teams now in, in all the all the A-League teams. Um, but it was such a good experience, not just as a, as a young footballer. You're, you're playing and living with the best athletes in the whole country. Yeah. Boxing, netball, basketball. Um, That's transferable skills. Yeah, yeah. and, and to, to eat with them, speak with them um, daily, breakfast, yeah. lunch and dinner, go to school with them and then also have your training environment, I think. Um, from the golden generation of Australian football, from you know, you know your Mark Padukas, yeah. all the way down to when it shut down, we have um, what, many players now that have gone on to play in the football league and in, in professional yeah. leagues and in, in England um, and in Europe and also in the World Cup. And yeah. that's down to a really, really good program. And I think, like, sorry, go ahead, Jamo, no but our boys obviously come in here. Um, most of them are Anglo-speaking. You know, a lot of them are Spanish as a second language. You know, so if they do progress, do go on to teams, it's uh, going to be in a, in a foreign language. I'm going to forget sat with you actually having, enjoying some lunch, you know, and uh, the call comes through, you know, you're someone's very respectful person, not normally on your phone, but, you know, I could tell you're itching a bit, and the call come through, walked away from the table, come back and sit down and go, yeah, I'm moving to Korea next week, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty surreal, but for you, that was your first time going into a country in a football environment where it wasn't going to be in English, obviously mm -hmm. Scotland, you know, they speak some form of English there, you know, down <laughs> in uh, at Burton as well, you know, it's all been English all the way through. What did that, when did that sink in that, okay, this is going to be different, you know? Yeah, well, coming into England first as a 17 year old at Reading, I initially wanted to come into a Holland or a Italy, for example, and I, I didn't have the passport to allow it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, opportunity limits you as a young Australian with only Australian passport yeah um, and then I have always wanted to go play in another country to learn a new language to learn a new culture um, so when the oppor opportunity presented itself I had 10 years all yeah. up in Scotland and, and in England I just was wanting a big change yeah um, yeah and it, and it came up we're having lunch together um, and it only really hit me after <laughs> maybe the first a few weeks there, I went to the second biggest city in Korea and their English is very limited and you're thinking, I, I really need to pick up some language sk yeah. skills here, otherwise it's going to be really difficult. Yeah. And I, th I think it's important that we highlight that fact as well, like, uh, you know, you listen to a lot of the boys there, even when you moved away at, at 17, even to England, you know, where you could speak the language, but even more so when you moved to Korea. The reality, when you set in, you know, you take all your stuff, you kind of land there, you shut the door behind you and there's no one else there but you and, your, you know, your, your family, you took your... Uh, your girlfriend right over there, uh, you didn't have your, your, your child at the time as well, which we'll touch upon in a second. <laughs> what, what is that, that reality like? Because again, yes, you are a professional footballer, yes, you're kind of living your dream, but it's not as glamorous sometimes as people may think when, you know, like you said, it can be lonely, it can, you know, there's, there's, some, there's challenges, let's say, to it, would you say? Yeah, for this instance, definitely, because we moved over during COVID and uh, the, I think all the Asian countries, especially Korea, took it really strict. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, first we moved over during COVID and the football crowds were at capacity or no crowds for the initial phase. Um, it was very isolating. Um, no family can come in to, to visit us. Um, and then as we kind of got through that little barrier, um, me and my wife fell, fell pregnant and um, that limited uh, going out and doing things as well and seeing <laughs> places and, and, and exploring. So, you know, we're, we're a lot of the times at home, um, training home, training home and um, yeah, it does get very, very lonely um, and we have family all around the world so the time difference doesn't help with, with still mm -hmm. continuing to, um, communication. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. I think even like, for the boys to see that even at that level because again, a lot of the boys are at a younger age now in sort of the 16, 17, 18 and away from home for the first time. Uh, but that never really gets, you know, goes away. Everyone, yeah. you know, gets homesick and so on. And I think that's what sets apart the people that are able to kind of really push on with their careers and make it versus those that, are, that don't because, you know, you have to be willing to sacrifice from that side of things. No, and I think that's, you know, a huge part of what Malaga City is for as well. You know, we talked about with the young lads before getting saturated football. That's some people's problem when they come here. It is too much football and they didn't like it as much as they, they think. But also it's a taste to see, can you deal with that homesickness? Are you a person that's got the makeup and prepared to mm -hmm. you know, move around the world to chase your dream and you know, play at all costs, so to speak? You know, Lots of us have done it, especially people sat here. You know, you've travelled to, to America, obviously you've been everywhere everywhere now, you know, <laughs> Scotland, uh, UK and now, now Asia. 
and obviously Nick Travis, you know, with the the connection doesn't stop with you know fantastic Barnets, you know, was he <laughs> Australian and been over to you know come through the English system, kind of done the reverse, you yeah. know, and and gone to play uh, in Australia yourself, you know. So another person that is a great example for for the lads here at Malaga City, and you know, first of all, not just welcome to the show, but welcome to 2023, and hopefully a long long term position here at FC Malaga City. Yeah, thanks, boys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the the great welcome, settling me in really quick. Chucking me in at the deep end. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, glad to be here. Um, from what I've seen so far, obviously I'm new to the place, but um, it's been really good people, good people around the place. Been really helpful. James has been really helpful. I've really got a, a connection from uh, where we're from. Well, when, yeah, yeah, where we're yeah. from, he's definitely from Rotherham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so glad yeah. that's come up, by the way. I'm so <laughs> glad that's come up. Yeah, I'm not letting him do it. <laughs> So, yeah, obviously um, really new to the place, but uh, so far uh, nothing but good things to say. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And, and Nick, you know, you're very modest on your, on your playing career, but you were very successful, you know, from the playing side. Obviously, we're going to focus a lot on the, on the coaching yeah. side today because you've seen even more success at that level. But give us a kind of background on, on yourself, your kind of quick run through. Yeah, so Sheffield United, from, from, being, from being young, from being 10, 11, I think, something like that, went into the academy system. Uh, so then all the way through to... I left at 22 after signing a couple of professional contracts. Uh, never really worked in the Sheffield United first team. I had a few loans, so got loaned out. Um, Chesterfield, Bournemouth, a couple of teams like that. Obviously, when Bournemouth were Bournemouth, Bournemouth were lower down the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then the opportunity came. Um, it was the chairman at the time, uh, Kevin McCabe, had connections in Australia. I don't know if he had connections with the club, but ended up moving to Central Coast. Uh, where I spent a couple of years out there, and that was brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Ended up going back to, back to Europe, um, Italy, where I spent a little bit of time. Um, both them, both them kind of moves got cut short through injury, so that was the kind of transition where I had to start thinking about what I wanted to do to stay in the game that I loved, obviously. And then that was. Uh, after I did a degree through the um, through the PFA, there's the Football Association in England, and then eventually progressed uh, to, to to the coaching routes and doing doing my badges through the coaching routes for these in English FA who were really good with me. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of background, a little bit of build up on how I kind of got brought yeah. through. And, and coming from the same place, just just give me an idea because I never got the opportunity to do so. I'm still uh, remaining patient. But what's it like to, you know, obviously from Sheffield to play for your yeah. boyhood club, you've then gone on to work for him. What does that kind of mean to you on a personal level? Yeah, incredible. Um, look, at, at the time, you probably don't really don't really notice it. And you don't really appreciate it as much because it, it gets a... Obviously, it's your job. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. you, 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 you're, turning up to, you're turning up to work. But... Looking back, yeah, what 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 I achieved um, to to play for him, to play for him, obviously not not in first team level, but to play for him and to Represent what we club. achieved at the coaching coaching mm -hmm. side of it. Looking back, was was incredible, really, from from where we started to kind of where we finished. Uh, was yeah, I'm really proud of the achievement and, and proud of the, also the people that I work with. I think obviously what. You guys achieved, you know, with that that group, you know, is absolutely spectacular. And and one thing I'd like to touch on the maybe not so we're talking about not so glamorous side. We were saying football was terrible, but it's obviously the best thing in the world. But I mean, obviously you represented that badge. You know, growing up Sheffield mm. lad, you know, sat there on the you know in the dugout. Um, you know, you lose three 0 at home or whatever. You know, and it's a very passionate club. You know, yeah. you walk to get your absolutely, Indian yeah. takeaway at night time, and you, know, you get in held with yeah. potentially. You know, what is it like to be at a club like that? That is so um, passionate. So, it's so historic. You know, uh, I'd say that the the wins are a little bit sweeter, yeah. but the losses hurt a little bit more. Um, I have been in Tesco with the kids and <laughs> people have shouted, what's happening down there? And I'm thinking, not now, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not now. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, I, I was lucky because the, the, the first five years yeah. were all Just up were up. all rocket. Yeah, so um, I was really lucky. Like the buzz, the buzz around town, it was kind of, you know, you get you get... No, I wouldn't say you get noticed, but you get um, mm. you get put into that bracket of that good period yeah. within the club. That period within the club was 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 on the upwards. Um, obviously, the people that I worked with were were incredible. The manager, the assistant manager, the coaching staff, every everybody, the analysts. Um, they all made it. They all made it easy for you. 
yeah. obviously everyone was together the togetherness and uh, yeah mm -hmm. the the group like the playing group that, you, that you're watching now were just incredible for a young coach like me yeah uh, for them to accept you and you know when you got players that are older than you and you've played you know they've played three four hundred games mm. and you're taking a session and they they really respect what you're saying and they're trying yeah. and you know you can see you can see that they're making a real yeah they're buying into it exactly it's a great word um, so yeah there's nothing nothing but good things to say about it that period it's uh, put me in a, put me in a good stead for the rest of my for the rest oh, of my career. Well, so you're a super young coach still, you know, you're going to be 35 in, yeah. a, in a couple of months. And where does that foundation now that you've already touched kind of the pinnacle of the sport, you know, you were talking to me about sitting in the Premier League benches, I've been at this yeah. ground and done that, you know, you've really seen inside the, the highest level that, you know, we all aspire to, to go to. I mean, you know, with the money in the Premier League right now, it is probably the most competitive yeah. globally. And, and where does that foundation now set you for... So I think, um, in, t in terms of what in terms of what I want to achieve, selfishly, it's mm. it's being back there. Yeah, um, I think everybody would probably realise that. Um, but now I think, as a young English coach, um, for me to get experience in a different place, in a different environment, uh, especially in Spain, where yeah. football is Everything, yeah. incredible, and what what them top teams are doing still now in yeah. Europe and Champions League wise and everything, they're still yeah. still dominant. Yeah. Uh, so to get this experience, um, however long it may last, and then also now in England you're seeing the young coaches getting these top jobs, mm -hmm. and you, you look at Graham Potter or Steve mm -hmm. Cooper and stuff, or real, real, real good coaches getting these good jobs and doing really well, and you know setting up these teams where they're trying to do little bits and bobs different, and you can see the to see the togetherness that yeah. they're instilling in their squad and. You know, it's like a, a real, real place where you can aspire to be. And yeah. also now, especially at championship level, yeah. uh, younger coaches are getting jobs. And, you know, that's 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 what I that's what aspire I see to. and that's what I aspire to be. Yeah. And just on that, does, have you appreciated anything? You obviously your transition from, you know, the playing side to the coaching side. Do you appreciate anything more now that you, you're seeing football from that side of the line rather than being on there, you know, yeah. and, and lacing yeah. up? Um, the hours are better as a player. <laughs> 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 the hours are better as a player. At twelve thirty, dinner and off. Yeah. Um, whereas probably the prep, um, obviously Ryan and No, um, the prep that goes into, you know, that goes into a Saturday is 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 incredible. Mm. It will it'll start literally. It'll start on the coach journey home yeah. after the game, uh, where you probably sat with the analyst going through going through opposition, upcoming opposition, and what you can do and how you can affect them and what they'll try and do on us and you know it's trying it's trying to play play a little game of chess against the opposition but um, in terms of uh, in terms of appreciating being a player like obviously Ryan is, is still young but mm. I would say as long as you can play as <laughs> play as long as you can yeah because yeah. obviously it's a real short career but um, long time retired. Yeah, long time <laughs> retired. And looking at these boys now, like like Flecky and players like that, who are incredible, incredible players, they probably they probably didn't realise how good and how much of a how much of an effect they would have had on the club and in, in what they what they've achieved. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah, I would say as long as you can play, as long as you can. So obviously, you started the journey with. Uh, Sheffield United in, in League One. Yeah, that's right. I mean, did Ryan Edwards never come on the radar as a potential uh, <laughs> transfer target? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, we we bypassed him. That yeah. <laughs> no, I no, I didn't. Obviously, um, we we uh, in League One actually Dominic. We had Dominic Calvert Lewin, mm. and um, I think in terms of us for us to recruit players, we had to kind of sell Dom. Yeah, um, and then that money got. Money got pumped back in, but um, the first four games in League One weren't great. We had <laughs> we had we had no wins from four, and then little bit pressure. Of, yeah, yeah, little bit, yeah, little bits and bobs changed. Obviously, the manager was Sheffield as well, yeah. so the manager uh, felt pressure. But then, obviously, something just clicked, and then uh, the season the season was incredible. Finished on hundred points. Um, I think most goals scored. In League One, I think most goals Incredible. scored in League One. Yeah. So yeah, um, and like we talk about, like Ryan, Ryan knows as well. It's 
the personalities within the group were just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, proper players, proper men. Yeah. Game day, you know, they, they, they turned up. Nobody hiding. And also, like, you have to mention the squad as well. Mm. You know, they, I think it's easy for... I think it's easier for the 11 out on the pitch because they're playing. Yeah, of course, they're buzzing. But yeah, so they're playing, so they're, so they're buzzing, they're getting that high, but then the boys off the bench, you have to make an impact. Then mm. the boys not, not in the squad, maybe in the stand. Mm. Plus um, trading levels. Exactly, yeah. So then um, you keep that group together and that strength, in, that strength in group really, really took mm. us through and made, made it build. You talk about the squad there. Obviously, when you would have first started on that, that journey, you know, a player that we're very close with that came out here and was a big part of the promotion for Amunica City last year, you know, Oliver Greaves. I know Greaves, yeah, he was yeah. on the fringe of it with, yeah. with you guys. What would you say for Seneca Greaves or other players that you've seen at the club or other clubs in the UK that might doesn't quite work out for whatever reason, you know, yeah. player in front of you, budgets, etc.? You've seen a snapshot of Malaga City. I think you've seen the senior team here train once. Mm. What would you sort of say is your first impact on someone like Agrives and what could Malaga City provide? Do you see it as a beneficial move to look yeah, at something like that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I think it's always always good to take yourself out of the comfort zone. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, the language barrier. Obviously, is a lot um, a lot of Spanish speaking here, but yeah. the language barrier is is good because kind of get by with, yeah. with obviously yourself and everyone yeah. English speaking. Um, mm. I could imagine, like Ryan said, the first three or four months where you go into a non-English speaking country would be difficult until yeah. you kind of get your, get your teeth into, into the language. But in terms, in terms of development, 100%, 100% go for it. Um, mm. If the opportunity comes, comes around to go and play and to go and play mm. in Spain and mm. different culture and you know the opposition, like we mm. spoke about before. The opposition is probably not what you expect. Yeah. Um, in terms of Spanish football in the top elite, top leagues, probably more tic attack. But yeah. this is really, really kind of great. hands on, aggressive, kind of physical, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and just just kind of pick your wits at that. And mm. you know, you you will get your opportunity to uh, to play. Mm -hmm. But initially, um, like in the lower leagues, in not the lower leagues, but the but the leagues in, in England, you, you, you literally have to win the battle first and, and right earn your right yeah. to play, exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, technical-wise, some technical boys, some real technical boys in the first team as well, that's so. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, I think that that's it. I think you just go and have to play. Mm -hmm. you, you have to go and play, add to your CV, and then... Mm -hmm. You, what happens yeah, will happen. It's just, a, it's, I, you never know, it's just one of them things that I you never think, know is watching. I think on that as well, like, it's not a guarantee that you come out of a club like Sheffield United, even with the stature it has. We've had the mm. Player of the Year from Leicester's youth team, we've had former mm. Liverpool Academy mm. players that, that fall out of that or don't get the, the, the contract or whatever happens. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to automatically get in the door at another place, exactly, you know. Yeah. So that, that ability to stay in full time football is the most oh, important, right? And, uh, and yeah. Um, I'd say the same question. Obviously, you know, you've been sat in the stands on a little nose around yeah. looking at what we're doing. You've been boots on, on the turf of us, you know, keeping yourself ticking over until uh, you know, the right move comes along. How have you found it being in with our, our seniors and in that environment? I've really enjoyed it. I would encourage anyone going through um, that period of, of, of contract or not sure what to do or trying to stay in English football, if that opportunity presents itself, to jump at it. Honestly, I, I'm the first time in my career I've finished my uh, Korean contract now on December 31 so it's mm. the first time I'd be a free agent in in the January transfer window so it's really difficult and to be honest I don't want to come into to this level of football mm. and, and train I, I wanted to have a contract sorted yeah kind of you have to wipe your ego a little bit yeah. and say you don't want to be staying in a park and training by yourself yeah um, so I've, I've come in and I've just I've it's it's surprised me in a in, in a really positive way um, mm. I think the intensity is is fantastic to be a part of, awesome. um, it's very sharp. Yeah. There's a, a for, for my experience, it's a different standard in terms of quality. Some yeah. some players are up here, some yeah. are down here. Obviously, there's a massive difference in ages, and yeah. um, you're trying to push the academy boys through yeah. as well, which is fantastic. But um, it's it's benefited me fantastic. I'm getting sharper every day. I'm training in a full time environment, which you can't replicate That's anywhere good. else. And do you think that? My one for you, right, you know, we mentioned obviously Nicky's tran transition there into the coaching world. Do you start thinking about the coaching aspect? Is it something that interests you for the future? Yeah, I've, I've put my uh, my toes in, in different things at the moment. So um, I've finished a degree in psychology mm -hmm. um, and I've completed my B licence with the Scottish FA. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Um, so I'm thinking about different different areas that I want to explore after mm -hmm. football. You know, you 
as a young lad, you always get told, study something, you know, you, yeah, you never yeah. know when your career, career ends. So I've really enjoyed the psychology side. I've worked with a sports psychologist for the last 10, 11 years from my time mm -hmm. at Reading, still kept that relationship uh, going. So it may be an area that I'd like to, uh, to explore. I've, I've just had a baby daughter. So I really like the child development side as well. Um, and then, yeah, I really enjoyed, I did my, my coaching badge at 23, 24 years old. So it was quite young to start the process. And I was the youngest on the course at the time. Um, and I just really, really enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that I'd like to, to, to maybe like, take, go explore. I don't take know. It, taking notes of that right <laughs> now, by the way, for next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. jumping across yeah. here yeah. to sign that. Not, yeah, not sure up. about a, a head yeah. coach job, but yeah. I think I'd like to, to be in the backroom staff. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, support. the psychology now is massive anyway. Yeah. Yeah. At the top clubs, it's like, it's just it's so big. Phenomenal. It's so mm -hmm. big. And I think, you know, um, so insightful and you know to have the chance first you know to have you visiting us and to be able to welcome someone like yourself Nick you know to the club is a, is a true privilege and you know, that word gets used too much but it really is and to spend some time with you and hear your individual stories and a little bit more you know both so humble and, and, and laid-back characters you know uh, apart from the great hair you know it's been great to hear <laughs> about um, you know hearing what you've learned from people around you you know and how truly humble you are and how much you're trying to take that in and, and just carry on with what you're doing so best of luck for 2023 to you both and thank you so much for your, giving up your time to come on thanks guys no thank you very much uh, george next up obviously we're going to round up with um you know all the kind of the latest what we can expect moving forward uh, like we said we've got off to a blockbuster start of uh, 2023 but some really exciting news to to kind of bring um and yeah just looking forward to getting into that show of 2023 and I tell you something the bar has been set very high and and more so by uh, you know our final two guests there what insight and you know I just hope that you know this gets out to our players our families and you know they give it the time that deserves to try and take what you can from it and pick it apart 100% like we said at the beginning of the show you know we're fans as much as everybody else that's watching this show and to listen to to Ryan with his uh, such unique experiences and then you know, Nick, who's, who's seen both sides and now the transition to coaching. Obviously, like we said, you know, only three years ago, he's coaching in the Premier League and we're fortunate enough to have him with us today. So feel very grateful, but it doesn't kind of stop there, George. You know, looking at this list we've got here, um, you know, there's a lot still to look forward to moving forward. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, the 10th year anniversary and, um, you know, of course, it's a, a very humbling moment that, you know, from what started from very small beginnings to, to be sat here 10 years later and experiencing what we are. But, you know, the footage we just see there, the Feminino, second time being invited, uh, you know, by PSV. What does that mean as, you know, someone who's really built from the ground up the, the female side of FC Malaga City? Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at it, playing these type of opposition in a one-off game is always a special occasion, right? But it's real, really complimentary uh, to be in, for these teams to come back to us and ask us for, for more games and build relationships. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, they know what they're getting from us, they're getting stiff opposition and girls that are really hungry to impress. 
and our girls, you know, for you know, just the, the pure excitement to come up against you know international level of opposition and so on. And to be doing that so early on in the programme history, you know, we think about the work that's gone in over the last 10 years on the men's side, but only three years into the female side and already to have that type of opportunity. And, and you know, more so, that, you know, with the German national team game that we had last week, uh, you, you associate Germany as, you know, one of the biggest Powerhouse. footballing powerhouses in, in world football. Uh, no doubt some of the players that played in that game will go on to do great things on the female side at such an important time. And, and we've touched upon it here. There's a real feeling around, you know, female football in general, especially yeah. here in Spain, um, but also around the world, would you say? And, um, and that links into our next point, you know? Yeah. Obviously, the trial of uh, Lucy and Unas. Um, what do you? I mean, how do you really sum up? I want you to do this justice. I mean, you're talking FC Malaga City, um, you know, FC Bayern Munich. You know, I never thought we'd say that. And um, you know, to be able to see, you know, a promising young player from the club, you know, been having a fantastic season, and and try and put that into words. It's, it's really, really difficult, you know, because you, you, you kind of, it's a pinch yourself moment. You have a lot of them at, at FCMC, but realistically, you're talking about one of the biggest footballing entities in the world, looking at one of our players and saying, we believe that she's good enough to come in and compete and be a part of what we want to do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that it's not kind of the last on the list and, and there'll be more to come. But realistically, how, how do you put that into words? How do you, you know, how, how do you perceive that from her side of things? and the experience and what that will do for the rest of her career. Uh, I just feel very, very grateful. You know, I'd, I'd like to think we don't have, you know, much to, to do with it on the sidelines, but for, for the players especially, it's just more, you know, happy for them and uh, excited to see where it takes them. And, and how is it going to, how's that trial going to look? You know, what is it going to consist of sort of time-wise and, and, and the yeah. details behind it? Well, again, with, with the situation with Nunes, you know, it's a situation where she was invited previously to, to go over to Germany through a connection, um, you know, much off her own back to be to be completely honest um, and trial with the second team at Bayern Munich she then gets invited back because they believe she has the level to potentially be considered for the first team um, and that's testament to her and the level she demonstrates um, and and you know in terms of the experience it's more so um, you know for her to really get a foot in the water at the elite level see if she can she can hang at that level and, and compete uh, with a view to maybe a longer term uh, view of getting her in on a, on a longer term basis. So again, incredible experience. I'm sure she'll learn a lot from it. Um, and yeah, we're just excited to see how it turns out for her. Um, but George, again, you know, Bayern Munich, you know, Barcelona's Atletico Madrid, this is something we've come, you know, accustomed to here at the club. Talk to us about how the rest of the season looks for the, for the academy as a whole. I think I've said on the show before, we have to make sure that we, we give each club the, the value and appreciation of what it is. I think to play against any professional side is, uh, is a huge honour, um, a huge showcase. And each one is an individual opportunity for our players to not only see what that level looks like and kind of get to that level but you know to learn to learn from those players you know we had John on the show earlier talking about you know his days with Granada and Mallorca how much he took out of that you know and, and treat with a international call up and you know what he's taken away from that I think you know when we go to PSG now in April um, you know we, we're going to be wiser to it you know having had the trip last year and these are things now that are becoming routine and you know but we while they're becoming routine which is fantastic they still need to be important and highlighted to the the significance that they are you know and that for me is going to be the the buzzword, if you like, for the second half of the season, you know, we've got PSG coming up, you know, we're playing in La Cartuja, which is where the Copa del Rey was played last year, you know, 60,000 seat stadium where we're going to take on um, Sevilla under the 19s, you know, again, something monumental moment for, for every player that will step onto the, the grass that day. Um, Tottenham, you know, is coming in uh, in May, Atletico Madrid in February. Um, it it kind of doesn't stop, you know, and it's almost like you, when, you're, when you're saying it, you don't believe what you're saying. For sure. Uh, there's nothing more to say really on that, you know, other than what an experience for the players. Um, you know, moving into the senior side, it's a really important second uh, part of the season. You know, we, as always here at the club, you know, not just the results, but seeing more and more players progress through the season, uh, through the system and the club structure, you know, is what we hope to see. We had three fantastic boys on the show today. They're really, really good to hear what they had to say. But there's an abundance more talent in the system at the minute. Um, and, that, and that's the hope, you know, is that they can take these experiences and not just take them for, for that, you know, for mm. the day out, to say they've played against Barcelona, to say they've played at, this, you know, the national team stadium. It's to then use that to then benefit them moving forward and, thrive, and, and thrive. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, what, talking of thriving at the moment, uh, you know, that brings us on to our kind of goal of the week contender. Um, you know, Luke will be buzzing that that we've thrown this in today, but I thought it was just such a such a you know, Galasso, yeah, yeah, a great strike <laughs> and uh, yeah, a little, little bit there, yeah. 
Um, I'm sure we'll pull the video up now um, and take a look at that. George, you can probably walk us through it, huh? Balls fall to him at the edge of the box he's here, and wow. Absolutely screamed it. I'll be honest, I've seen a lot of those go over in training, George, <laughs> you know. I don't know if he's got lucky there or what, but, um, you know. A few hit the traffic going by at the back, but that <laughs> yeah. one he's caught absolutely perfectly. As it deserves a replay down. as well. Let's have a look at that. Straight on the volley, into Screamer. the bottom bins, yeah. I'm sure that's on his social media already as well, and rightly so. Absolutely. So we're going to try and do more of this, you know, as the season progresses, really try and highlight the, the talent and the um, and, and the lads. What the boys are doing, you know. It's like they train so hard every day, and when you see it transition from the training pitch into a, into a game environment, you know, unfortunately, obviously, you know, Nick Travis's debut here and... Uh, on a negative result, but you know, that is a, a real crop of talented under 23 players right now that, you know, again, we've been writing down a new goal setting for, for 2023 and is to, to secure the best squad that we can for, for the new year and promote them through the club as they, as they need to, you know. Uh, I know, I know Monzo missed a penalty in that game, but another player for me with so much you know, physical prowess and what he could bring and he's tactically getting better all the time. Um, you know, there's a, a number of boys there right now, you know, who had um, Matthias Bratton training with the Malaga City group as well, mm -hmm. very intelligent young football player. And I think we're, we're really getting close with the energy that's around us, the people that we're bringing in, the opportunities that we're, we're making, not just with the Tessera team, but with all the showcases, that we're, we're all pushing each other constantly to go up and we're getting a real special crop of players that we need to cultivate. And I think that can carry us through for the next wave of uh, you know the senior teams. 100%. So, you know, George, always a pleasure to share the, the stage with you, so to speak. But... Uh, guys, you know, if you're interested in learning more about the club, like we say, these things are happening so frequently at the moment. We try to keep the audience and the families at home, you know, and around the world as up to date as possible. One of the great outlets in doing so is is uh, our quarterly newsletter. Uh, we'll be releasing that shortly. Uh, you know, to mark the 10 year anniversary, obviously comments for yourself, details on Tariq and John's trials uh, and so much more uh, content that we're, we're excited to share with you. So fantastic bedtime reading. Uh, yeah, exactly. So for, as always, um, you know, really grateful for everybody watching at home and uh, already looking forward to the next one. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you.